Happy Monday, and welcome back to the Lord and Arts channel. I'm John Lorden. Thank you so much for spending some time with us here today. Case Cracked is the show where we look into a mystery, and what are the critical pieces that help solve that mystery? Today's case is called Baby Paul Number 2. It was 1964 in Chicago, Illinois, and Chester and Dora Franzak were celebrating a big milestone. The day before, on April 25th, Dora had given birth to a boy named Paul Joseph Franzak. The couple was in the room at Michael Reese Hospital, focused on the newest addition to their family, when a nurse arrived and insisted that the baby needed to be returned to the nursery for more rest and testing. Little did Chester and Dora know that when they handed Paul over, their lives would be sent down a terrible path. After some time had passed, the Franzaks asked to see their baby again, only to be told that little baby Paul was no longer in the hospital. In a panic, staff scrambled, but were unable to find baby Paul or the nurse who carried him away from his parents' room. When the nursery was checked and all the other babies were accounted for, they knew baby Paul had been stolen. Baby Paul's abduction started a nationwide manhunt. 200 police officers canvassed all of Chicago, going door to door with a sketch of the mysterious nurse. The FBI became involved and asked mail carriers and the media to help in the search as well. They found nothing. It was soon concluded that this nurse didn't work at the hospital at all. There was a lack of forensic evidence, and Paul had no real distinguishing features, such as a birthmark, that could help with his identification. At the time, the only thing investigators could use were his blood type and ear shape, which was a common practice in early forensics. By 1966, 10,000 babies had been examined, but none were the child they were looking for. Thankfully, that same year, they had a breakthrough. A young boy had been found abandoned in a New Jersey mall in his stroller. He was the right age, and his ears seemed to match Paul's. The Franzaks were elated to finally have their son back. National newspapers showed the couple holding Paul along with the quote, That's my baby. It's Paul. Soon, the whole family was back home with Paul, trying to pick up from where they had left off. As Paul matured, even though he says he had a happy childhood, he always felt like he didn't quite belong with Chester and Dora. At 10 years old, the Franzaks told him the truth about his early years and the abduction. Realizing that he might not be who he thought he was, Paul was determined to find the truth. It would take decades, but in 2012, when DNA technology had advanced enough, he convinced Chester and Dora to take an over-the-counter DNA test to put his mind at ease. He would never find that comfort. The Franzaks found out that they were not related to Paul in any way. As the news, social media, and law enforcement began their search for the real Paul, the current Paul was full of questions. Who was he? And where were his parents? Were they still alive? And did he have any siblings? Most importantly, he wondered what had happened to the real Paul. With renewed attention on the case, investigators started to look at old suspects. After a 2020 investigation special on the case aired in 2013, a man called into his local media outlet to say that he thought his mother was the kidnapper. His mother was a woman named Linda Taylor. Called America's welfare queen by none other than Ronald Reagan himself, Taylor was known to have used up to 100 aliases and 50 fake addresses in her welfare scams. One room in her home was filled with costumes and wigs that she wore during her schemes, and some of those were doctors' and nurses' uniforms. Her son recalled that at some time during the 1960s, his mother brought home a baby boy that he nicknamed Tiger. One day, when he came home from school, Tiger was gone. She never offered him any explanation as to who the boy was or where he had been taken. Quote, My mother was capable of anything. Not only stealing a baby, but she could steal you. She was just that kind of woman. You know, she'd done whatever it took for her to survive. Eventually, Linda was caught and found guilty of multiple counts of welfare fraud. 
She was sentenced to two to six years for claiming public assistance, social security, and veterans benefits that were not hers. However, no evidence of her involvement in the abduction of baby Paul was ever found. In 2014, a man named Sam Miller came forward and claimed to be Paul. His resemblance to the age progression photos was uncanny. Sam had grown up in a suburb of Chicago and was adopted by a family. Unfortunately, Sam had recently been diagnosed with kidney disease and now needed to know his family medical history. His original adoption papers were located, and Sam found out he was not Paul, after all. That same year, a team of genetic genealogists led by C.C. Moore, known for helping to solve the Golden State Killer case, volunteered their time to help find Paul's biological parents using genetic genealogy. The team was successful. They found out that his real name was Jack Rosenthal. Jack learned that his mother had been an alcoholic, and his father was described as a disturbed veteran. Unfortunately, they were both now deceased, but the family also claimed that he had a twin sister named Jill that had disappeared as well. Jack was told his parents were abusive and frequently kept the twins in a cage when they were babies. Now knowing his biological parents were dead, he wanted to concentrate his efforts on finding his sister, as well as the real Paul. As Jack continued his search, one family in Manton, Michigan, were particularly struck by the Franzak story, and in 2018, they provided the break in the case that everyone was looking for. The daughters of a man named Kevin Beatty, a machinist and mold maker, became convinced that he was Paul. One of the daughters offered her DNA to a genealogy website and found out that her father was very likely the abducted infant. Kevin's family soon connected with the Franzaks, who called the FBI. The results were checked and confirmed. Kevin was contacted and told his real identity, that he was baby Paul. His stepbrother told media outlets that the woman Kevin thought was his biological mother, a Michigan resident named Lorraine Fountain, had been dating a doctor in the 1960s from Chicago when suddenly, and with no explanation, she moved to Arkansas for a year. When she returned to Michigan, she had a new baby boy that she named Kevin Beatty. Lorraine isn't believed to be the kidnapping nurse, but somehow, baby Paul wound up coming home with her. Initially, after the discovery of his real identity, Kevin kept to himself and tried to come to grips with the new reality. Eventually, he finally talked with the press, saying, quote, I have loose ends to tie up. The reunion wasn't what anyone expected or hoped for. His biological father, Chester, had passed away in 2017. He was able to talk with his biological mother, Dora, but had to deliver some bad news. At this point, Kevin was dying from cancer. A year and a half later, on April 25th, 2020, he finally succumbed to his illness and passed away. April 25th was also his true 56th birthday. Kevin's obituary would focus on the only life he had ever really known and the family who raised him. The identity of the woman who abducted baby Paul is still not known, but investigators have reopened the case to try to find her. Sadly, no one can ask Lorraine for more details, as she passed away in 2004. To this day, Jack Rosenthal, the second Paul, still looks for his twin sister, Jill, hoping to someday have a reunion of his own. Quote, The only reason I started this journey was to find my parents' kidnapped son, Paul. If I found out who I was in the process, that was a bonus. I never imagined that this mystery would only get bigger as we found more answers. Case Cracked. I would like to thank WGNTV.com, WoodTV.com, The New York Post, CW39.com, ABC13.com, BBC.com, and The Toronto Sun. Of course, the biggest thank you goes to Christy Arnhart for researching and writing up today's case, and here she is to discuss it with us now. Well, Christy, um, we do get surprised in certain stories, but this one really teaches us that, man, these stories do not come out how you would expect. I was hoping for glowing family reunion and 
it's just like it's a tragedy of um near misses almost you know Mm -hmm. like he finally gets in contact with his family his father's passed away he's about to die himself gets to talk to his mother i mean it's really really sad on so many levels what are are your Mm -hmm. feelings about the outcome on this one there is there's a lot to unpack here there are a lot of twists and turns and it seems like every one of them are just heartbreaking yeah yeah i mean to think of going through a tragedy like that um, and then supposedly, cause it's years later, I mean, he, he looks like he's what, like five years old or so when the new Paul is found and given back to them. I think he was a little bit younger, but yeah. Okay. But yeah, I mean, just you know, years have passed and mm-hmm. you've been going through this for so long. And then you think that you, you've got your son back. Um, I don't know. It's just, it's really heartbreaking to compound all that. There was actually a tragedy even before all of this tragedy. Nora gave birth a year before baby Paul, but unfortunately that baby was stillborn. Yeah. And then a year later, you have Paul born, healthy, and then within 36 hours of him being born, he's kidnapped. I just, I can't believe what that woman had to go through. It's terrible. I can't either. And I don't blame her a bit when they came to her and said, we thought we think we have Paul. I yeah. latched onto that with everything I had. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And especially they didn't have strong forensics at the time. Mm-hmm. Um, one of the things I guess that they did do, and I think on my baby paperwork, they have footprints as well, but mm-hmm. sometimes they'll take baby's footprints because those, those can also be used a lot like a fingerprint for identification mm-hmm. purposes. But specifically for baby Paul, they didn't have his footprints. They did at that hospital have ID bracelets that they would use so that they mm-hmm. couldn't, you know, get the babies mixed up or anything like that. But obviously that could have been removed. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. The investigation also took a little bit of an interesting t- approach with they looked into infant deaths that were happening in the area at that time, thinking that a grieving family might have taken baby Paul, you know, their, Mm -hmm. their baby just passed away. And then they do this thing where they go and make this abduction. I really thought it's an interesting angle in terms of investigating something, but Mm -hmm. I mean, the logistics of like, are you reaching out to people that have just gone through this? And then you're asking, Hey, do you have a kid that has shown up there recently? I mean, it's just, it's, I don't uh, even know how they'd go about that. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's really really touchy. I mean, I guess you could contact family members or or neighbors and kind of ask, you know, hey, have you been hearing a, you know, the sounds of a baby in this particular home or something like that? Maybe not be so invasive. Mm-hmm. It, it seems it's weird because as an investigative step, it sounds like something reasonable. You know, yeah, maybe someone like that that's experienced that type of loss would do something like this. But then how Mm -hmm. you process that part of the investigation, I'd certainly like to learn more about someday. I would too. Um, One of the – it's interesting because it's another hard aspect of this story. But in a way, Jack being removed from his family situation turns out to probably be a really good thing for his life. Mm -hmm. Because he winds up with this caring family that raises him and then goes on for, you know, trying to find his own family later and then hears about all that. But hearing uh, babies kept in a cage and him not knowing where his sister is, uh, did you bump into any information about his investigation for his sister or any leads or aspects? I I haven't found anything. Yeah. Yeah. And I know he is looking. But it makes me so concerned for her well-being. If she is still out there, I mean, her parents could have been the ones to do this. They could have been the, they could have killed her. Yeah. That's why nobody's found her all these years. So he really would have been the lucky one. It's possible. But also looking at him as an example of what happened, you know, like if she was left somewhere else and Mm -hmm. she got rolled up into an adoption process um, and maybe didn't have that same intuition that he did about, hey, I feel different. They, these don't feel like my parents. Um, she might not know. And how do you find someone that that doesn't know? You know, that's a, a big twist in this is Jack coming to that realization. If he didn't have that realization, there is no mystery of baby Paul. It's just mm-hmm. he, he steps into that role and that's that. Uh, you know, Kevin goes off and has his life and that's that. And 
no one ever knows any different. So I'm all I'm also wondering, yes, I'm worried that Jill has has met a terrible fate, but mm-hmm. there is a possibility just seeing what else has happened in this story. Once again, very hard to determine what's going on with stories like this. Yeah. Uh, maybe she's out there. She just doesn't know it. I hope so. Yeah. And of course, the big question, um, is Linda Taylor possibly the nurse? Was Tiger really any part of this and they just haven't made that connection or has this all just fallen out of consideration? Do you have more details on that at all? Well, the only details I could really find about that is that Linda's son thought the boy had been given to one of her ex-husbands in Tennessee. Okay. But the ex-husband only said that she showed up with a newborn and could give them no no more information. Well, Tennessee is right next door to Arkansas. Mm. So, you know, hmm. Taylor never admitted to the kidnapping and she never faced any kind of charges in connection to it. But tentatively, yeah, that does kind of make sense. It's interesting because we know they had some form of like composite sketch or something about the nurse. So I would imagine if the actual nurse was Linda, that at least they would have had some inkling about that based on the on the composite information. And that didn't seem to come out. So, no. um, yeah, I don't know. Maybe the nurse is someone else. That's a whole mystery piece to this that I don't know. If it the, is. And it could be the, either be incredibly intriguing or mundane. I don't right, know which. <laughs> right. Yeah. Who knows? Who knows? Yeah. Well, thank you so much for all your hard work on this, Christy. We really appreciate you. And I've got some other people to thank right now. Thank you, PayPal supporters Michael Park, Larissa Mertschenk, and Kelly Joe from I Am Me. If you'd like to support the channel, please visit lordandarts.com. There you can sign up for Patreon, sign up for PayPal, buy merchandise, or even just buy us a coffee like Tracy Wilson did. We know that learning about the mechanisms that help support and find justice in these cases is important to understand the many unsolved cases we also cover, and we really appreciate your support in allowing us to continue doing that. Remember, you can get another Lord and Art story every week on the Seriously Mysterious podcast. A new episode is coming tomorrow and every Tuesday after that. Visit SeriouslyMysterious.com and remember to subscribe on your favorite podcatchers. Please also don't forget to subscribe below and hit that bell icon if you'd like to catch one of our weekly Secret Studio live shows. And of course, I'll be back with a new Unsolved Mystery for you on Friday, right here on the Lord and Arts channel.